welcome to our weekend worship service. If you're able, would you stand to your feet with us? Come on, let's give him some praise this morning. Amen. He is indeed worthy of it. Come on, we serve a faithful, powerful, wonderful God. And his word tells us he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So come on, if you believe that, we're just going to give him some glory and some praise this morning. And forevermore, no other name that can save, deliver, and restore. Oh, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore.
worship you, Lord. Come on, church, we serve a God who is seated on the throne. He is in control, and he is the lamb that was slain in our place. Amen. Come on, he's worthy of our praise this morning. We worship you, Lord. season of our lives. His word says, goodness and mercy shall follow us. Hallelujah. Today we're here to sing of us love in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. You are a good God. We love you and we 
We sing of your praises, oh God. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on. All my life you have been faithful. You have, Lord. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your
You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Come on, let's sing that out. And seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up our beautiful. You are my all in all. Come on, sing his name. And Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Sing Jesus the Let's sing that chorus one more time. Sing Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worship you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So good, God. Well, thank you so much, church, for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen. God is so good. Good morning. My name is Robbie Joe. I'm the children's pastor here at Crossroads, and I want to welcome you to church this morning. How many of you are glad you made it today to church? It is a beautiful day, and there's no better way to start it than with child dedication. I'm going to ask our families to come forward. And as they do, I want to let you, church, know we have 22 children getting dedicated to the Lord between our two campuses and our multiple services today. All right. Let's meet these little ones. Over here, we have Grady Arthur Foote. Next, we have Elliot William Groves. Next, we have Ezekiel Joseph Jackson. Next, we have Hans Trumacy Mensa. Next, we have Riley Massa. And next, we have Sarah Orchawa.
parents, can you take a minute and look at me? I want to encourage you today. I want to get where I can, you all can see me. I was preparing for this today, or this week, and a scripture jumped out to me that was not your normal child dedication scripture, and I want to read it to you. It's in Joshua. In Joshua, God gives a charge to Joshua. He's going into battle. And no, parenting isn't a battle, but sometimes it might feel like it. And all the parents said amen, right? (laughs) Well, Joshua, God says to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Therefore, the time has come to lead these people. I'm telling you today, therefore, the time has come to lead these people. You have been called to lead these little ones. Verse 6 says, be strong and courageous. You can do it. Verse 7 says, be strong and be very courageous. And verse 9, it says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. He says it three times. I'm not saying you need to know this, but you need to be strong and courageous, but there will be times as a parent when you're raising your child to know the Lord that you have to go against the grain of this world and you have to be strong and courageous when doing that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 9 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Don't be discouraged, parents. Just like God said to Joshua, don't be discouraged. He will go with you. Lead these people. In one of the versions I read, it said, you have been chosen to lead these people. Not your neighbor, not your auntie. God gave these children to you to lead. So lead them. The best way to lead them is by example. Live a life that shows people Jesus. Shows your little people Jesus. Amen? You got this, parents. You are doing an awesome thing dedicating your little ones to the Lord. I'm going to have you turn back around. And as our ministers come, I want to tell you all a testimony. A lot of times... I ask you all to partner with these families. I'm going to tell you a story. Last week, we were at kids camp. And there was a family in the church who dedicated their little one to the Lord here at this church. And they went to kids camp. And the mom came home and said, their daughter, their oldest daughter, who I think was about third grade, said, Mom, I heard God. I can hear God. And then she went on and she said, you know what God wants me to do? God wants me to tell children about Jesus. Now church, I don't know if she's called to children's ministry or if she's called to her school in a week to tell people about Jesus. But what I know is this church partnered with that family and sent There are kids to kids camp so that her life could be changed for eternity. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being faithful and praying for these families, for being faithful in giving of your time and energy to these families. And I want to say that is the church coming alongside these families to see life change. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to stand and we're going to stretch our hands forward and we're going to pray for these little ones. God, I thank you for Grady. God, I thank you for Elliot. God, I thank you for Ezekiel. God, I thank you for Hans. God, I thank you for Riley. And God, I thank you for Sarah. God, I thank you that these parents have decided to make the best decision they could make to raise their child to know the Lord. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom 
as they raise these children. God, I pray that you would give them favor. God, I pray that you would be with them, that you would lead them, that you would guide them. And God, I pray that you would be with us as a church family, that we would stand together with these families, lifting them up in prayer, lifting them up in all that they need and partnering with them. God, I thank you. I thank you that they will go and lead these children well. God, I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' holy, holy name, amen. Thank you, church family. Thank you. Families, you may be seated. Thank you so much for making the best decision, dedicating your little ones. Amen, amen. Can we give it up one more time for all of our families that dedicated their children this morning? Yeah. What an amazing time. I always love child dedication. It's, it's just a beautiful moment to, uh, to just reflect on. Well, good morning, Crossroads. My name is Pastor Mitch Correa. I am the Director of Student Ministries here at Crossroads. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I am also the Assistant Campus Pastor here in East Hartford. I want to thank you guys for joining us online. We pray you're blessed by the service this morning. And really quickly, I'm not going to embarrass you, make you raise your hand, but can we give it up for our first-time visitors in the building? You know who you are, and we just want to thank you guys for being with us. And we always have to let you know, we have something going on here at Crossroads called Connection Point. And the whole reason it exists is for, you know, whether you're a first-time visitor or whether you've been here for a while, we want to get you plugged in. We want to get you plugged into a community, somewhere to serve. I mean, you just saw how many families up here with little ones that need to be poured into, right? So maybe God tugged on your heart and said, oh, man, maybe the nursery, maybe the toddler room, God bless you. Uh, it may be, Whatever it is, maybe God's tugging at your heart and saying, hey, serve, serve, or pour into someone. Or maybe he's just saying, get connected with a family here. If that's the case, there's a number on the screen. You can go ahead and text connection to that number. If you're online with us, you can click the link in the chat. Uh, maybe you're here and you're old school, you know, uh, and you, you like filling out a, a card. There's cards on the seat back in front of you, unless you're in the first row, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but you can fill that out, and we have dedicated servants who want to connect with you after the service. Does that sound good? All right, awesome. Well, I just have one more announcement for you guys, and that is that Crossroads has partnered with SEU to provide a satellite campus right here. So maybe, maybe you're interested in ministry, right? Maybe you're interested in getting some hands-on experience. Well, here at Crossroads, you can do that for a fraction of the cost of going to uh, actual SEU or going to any actual campus. And, and you can do it at your own pace. And that's really what we provide here. And so if any of that interests you, you can speak to either Pastor Luke or Pastor Ermi after the service today, or you can reach out to us during the week. Does that sound good? All right, awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and call our ushers forward as we prepare to take the Lord's tithe and our offerings. So how many people, just quick show of hands, attended our outdoor night of worship this, uh, this Friday? It was amazing. Let me tell you something. We had five people prepared to be baptized on Friday. But what was more amazing was 21 more people came forward spontaneously and were baptized. How amazing is that? I can't, I, I, I couldn't, I, I was so honored to be able to be a part of that. This Friday, I remember just, just God just doing something in my heart, reminding me of when I was just 12 years old, and I was so excited to get baptized, and I was, ex I was so excited to show the world that I was a man of God. <laughs> but God did something special in my heart, and I wanted the world to know and to see all these people touched for the first time and have their lives changed forever by the Holy Spirit. I couldn't help but be honored and think, God, I can't believe you're using me. I can't believe you're using me in this moment when you use someone else for me. That's my thought this morning, church, is, is be there for someone else the way God used someone else to be there for you when you needed it. Amen? Amen. So this morning, let's, let's, let's use this time as a complete act of surrender, this time of worship, this time during the service. Let's reflect on what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. Amen?
Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. God, I thank you for hearts of worship in this place this morning, Lord. God, I thank you for hearts of complete surrender, God. And I thank you for testimonies, testimonies of your goodness, Father God, of your love, Lord. God, we praise you openly and wholeheartedly this morning, Lord. Would you have your way with our lives, Jesus? Holy Spirit, have your way in this room this morning and continue your work, Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ 
And my debt he paid Crushing every stronghold love has come He made a way Let's sing that together with one voice No death, no life Nothing separates me from the love of Jesus Christ to your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much, church, for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Crossroads. It is so good to see you. Thanks for joining us this weekend for our online services. I'm Luke Monahan, your online campus pastor. If you've got a Bible with you, we're going to be in Philippians again. In fact, we've been in Philippians for the last couple of weeks. We are doing a series as we walk through or flip through all of the verses of Philippians. In fact, over the past couple of weeks, Pastor Sean has already covered about the first half of the chapter. And so by way of recap, one of the most significant questions that has been asked so far in this series is, what's the greatest priority in your life? What is the most important thing? In fact, you might remember just from last week, Pastor Sean had this card, and he asked you for the peak value of your life. The Apostle Paul has made it clear that it's the advancement of the gospel. His greatest value is to tell people about Jesus. In fact, as we continue on, we're going to be looking at more of his answer and more of his rationale as he continues to unpack what the peak value of his life is. If you remember, he's also currently in prison. He is quite possibly literally chained to guards, and he is rejoicing in the suffering that has been permitted to him that has allowed for the gospel to spread. While he's not happy to be suffering, he's happy for the result of that suffering. And so then we asked in that week, what is your goal? What is your goal in life? Is it to honor Christ in all that you do? Because whatever the top priority of your life is, that is the things that you will lean toward and gravitate toward. Whatever your top priority is, people will recognize it. And in fact, you will affect people towards or away from the things that are most important in your life. You will embolden others, whether it be for good or for bad, by what is most important. 
And so Paul's great desire is that in his body, through his body, by his flesh and his works, that Christ would be magnified, whether in life or in death. So we're going to pick up then in verse 21 of chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 21. We'll come back for later verses, so if you want to just keep that around. Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Have you ever been homesick? Have you ever been really, really homesick? Have you ever been the kind of homesick where it's like a tangible, physical weight that you can feel, a thing that you want so bad that you're looking for? So this past week, I was at kids camp. So we had many of our kids there at camp. And in fact, kids from other churches too. Uh, some of them as young as third grade. There were definitely more than a few experiences with homesickness. Some a little more extreme than others. But one of the things that I noticed about homesick is nobody gets homesick when they're having fun. Nobody gets homesick when they're running around, playing games, throwing water balloons, doing all kinds of crazy activities and events. No one's homesick when they're busy. It's only during the quieter times, during the slower, boring times, during the times when you have a minute to kind of take a breath. Now remember, Paul is in prison. It looks like he has a lot of time. It looks like he has a lot of time on his hands to just kind of think, wait, hope, and anticipate. But here's the most interesting thing about Paul's homesickness. He's not looking for where he came from. He's not looking for Tarsus. He's not longing for the place that he was actually born. Paul's particular homesickness is about the place that he is trying to get to. He is anticipating and longing to be with Jesus. And the current reality of his life causes him to think a lot about it. It is a very real, very near present possibility. Not a long, far off thing, but something that is possibly very close. For some, it might seem really weird to say, well, how can you be homesick for a place you've never been? Or how can you be homesick expecting death or even considering the possibility of death? See, the thing is, Paul knows who he is. He knows where he's going and what he's doing. Paul knows what the plan and the purpose of his life is. He understands the purpose of God's plan for him. And so he says it like this in verse 22. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. We have here in the scriptures this fundamental truth, this primary example, thing we need to understand. What we live and die for defines our life, our legacy, and our eternal destiny. The things that we live and are willing to die for, this defines us, defines how we are remembered, defines what we do. And so Paul says it like this, for me to live is Christ. To live is being with Christ, is to consider him, is to be about his business. My life is about him. Now this verse, this Bible quote, is something you may have heard before. You might recognize it, you might be familiar with it, maybe you've even said it. But I think the question that we ask is, is it true? Or perhaps it's better asked, do you believe it? Do you live like it's true? Is that something that affects your life and the places that you go and the things that you go about? Do you act as if that is true? For some of us, it might be slightly longer than others, but you may remember high school. I remember English class. I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Green my sophomore year. Not entirely sure. But the story we were doing was the old man and the sea. Pretty sure he's a fisherman. A lot of the details are really murky. But I remember this one part, and it's funny, when I googled old man in the sea, this was like the first result that came up. So this must be the high school English teacher bullet point. Talk about this. So there's a line in this story that says, a man can be destroyed but not defeated. And we talked about it in English, what that meant. Could you really be destroyed? Could you be defeated? Can you win in defeat? Is such a thing even possible? Does that exist? Is that a reality? 
Who decides what victory even is? Who decides what it means to win? And so, can death bring gain, as Paul says it? If your body is destroyed, are you defeated no matter what? For those who follow Jesus, we understand that, no, there is much gain. There is victory in death. But society around us really does not seem to accept that as even a possibility, let alone a truth. If you look at society, we are caught in the here and the now. The only reality is what's happening right now, and the only thing that really matters is making more of life more enjoyable, more fulfilling, more fun, more pleasurable. It's all about what's happening to me right here and now. In fact, we spend vast amounts of time and wealth trying to eliminate threats to our life and our health, trying to fight against death and the possibility of death because everything is about enjoyment and maximizing what's going on. And certainly you're not doing that if you're in any kind of suffering as Paul was experiencing. We have role models of people like Frank Sinatra who's saying, I did it my way, who talks about my own importance and way of going about it. When these folk asked, how do we live life to the fullest? How do I maximize me? You often get answers that are focused in yourself. There's this guy called Steve Jobs. Some of you might remember him. He started Apple. If you have an iPhone still, he, he basically created it, though I'm sure he had a lot of other guys who helped. Also, Pixar. He was in charge of Pixar for a while, if you've seen just a whole litany of movies. So years ago, when he was still alive, he was asked to speak to a graduating class of seniors at Stanford College. He gave them lots of advice, and you can find all the details online, but a couple of bullet points. This was his advice to them. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma and have the courage to follow your own heart and intuition. On one hand, this might seem reasonable. You can get a perspective where this is not really terrible advice. But on the other hand, there's a couple of problems with his basic life and understanding, his premise for going about existence. One, there is a bit of an intellectual paradox where he says there are no absolute truths. Your truth is your truth, and it doesn't matter. Someone else can disagree, and everyone can be fine. But beyond just that bit of confusion about saying don't follow someone else, he says it to this, and we're going to put his advice to the test of God's word. The advice is don't be trapped by dogma. Now, that's probably not a word that you use a lot, but it was a word that he used. Dogma is simply this. It's a principle or a set of principles laid down by an authority as an incontrovertible truth. Somehow truth has come to the point where we actually need qualifying words, like, oh, no, no, it's not truth, it's true truth, like it's authoritative truth. We shouldn't need that. Truth should stand by its own. But we've come to the point where truth has been so challenged that it actually needs qualifications. And so Steve Jobs is telling this class, don't be considerate of other people's truths. Don't get caught up in what they decide is true. You figure out for yourself what is true. You figure out for yourself what is most important, what is the peak value of your life, what is the thing that makes your life worth living. So when we look at this through the light of the Bible, we know instantly that it falls short because the Bible is full of our truth, of Reliable truth. Let me give you a quote from a different famous person. This person also has more than a few followers, many works published, lots and lots of copies of their book sold or their contribution to the book. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 17. It says it like this in verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who turns away from the Lord. They will live in the parched places of the desert. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I, the Lord, search the heart to give every person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. 
two sets of advice, two ways of viewing the world, two ways of going about life and reality. Figure it out on your own. Do your own thing. Make up your own mind. Don't listen to anyone else. Or learn from the Lord, from his wisdom, from the truth that has been imparted from him and to us through the ages and generations. There's really not a middle ground here. You really do have to take one or the other. You have to pick one option or the other. One says, authority that claims to have truth is not reliable, is doubtworthy. The other one says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow after me. Of course, following after Jesus is the answer. It is the right answer. But knowing the answer, saying the answer, and then going in that direction and living that answer can sometimes be pretty different things. It's easier said than done. And I think that Paul is experiencing some of that difficulty here as he talks about what his future looks like, as he even just reflects on it. He doesn't really have a choice at this moment, but he's struggling with, I recognize what God wants, but it's not so easy. So another fundamental truth of our lives is that the world says, live for yourself. But the creator says, abundant life comes from knowing and following me. In fact, Jesus says it like this in John 10, 10, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And now Paul definitely understands this. He knows that this is true, and this is part of why he struggles in the dilemma. He struggles with, it will be good to be with Jesus, but yet when I am here, I can live with him and live in through him. To live is Christ for Paul. What is it for us? What is life? What is it to live? When you choose to live for something, you have to choose to die for it as well. If you really are living for it, you're willing to live your life to the very end for it. Or, additionally, when you choose to live for something, you're choosing not to live for all of the other things. Let me introduce you to a man named James Harrison. You probably don't recognize this gentleman. You've probably never encountered him. He is an 85-year-old Australian man, but he's got a pretty incredible story. When he was about 14 years old, he had open heart surgery and needed blood transfusions. Now, the blood transfusion saved his life. So at 18, when he was old enough to start giving blood, he decided he would regularly do that as a way of kind of paying forward the, the gift that he had been given. But it turns out that there's something very unique about his blood. Now, I could totally nerd out on all the science and probably lose most people. If you want the super nerdy story, you can look up RH disease. But here is the most important fact. His blood has antibodies already in it. He has these RH antibodies. And this RH disease, what it does is it causes pregnant women's immune system to attack the baby. There's only about 50 people in all of Australia who have these antibodies. And so this guy didn't just give blood once or twice. He gave blood almost every week, which is not even the way we usually are able to give blood. And they turned what was already in his blood into treatment that saved the lives of 2.4 million Australian children. Every week for 60 years, he gave his blood. Every child who was treated in Australia was treated by his blood, by his life-saving inheritance. And they think it came. They think he got it by way of that earlier blood transfusion. When you look at someone who knows what their life is about, who knows what is most important, you can see the way that they prioritize. He made sure to give blood time and time again. He made sure that this was what mattered to him. Now, I don't know about you, but I can see a few parallels. I can imagine someone else whose blood gives life. I can think of someone whose shedding of blood is good news to everyone else. If you can't, spoilers, it's Jesus. And we'll be back to talk about him in a couple of moments. This man knew what his legacy would be, what he wanted his legacy 
to be. We have opportunities in our life to examine our legacy. Steve Jobs, as he gives this advice to those students, knows what he wants to be remembered for and how he wants people to respond to him. Just earlier in these services, we did child dedication. These are about presenting and living legacy to help the next generation know what they ought to be about. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to make the right choice about how to live and what to do. And so Paul recognizes this difficulty. But in verse 24, he says this, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Paul recognizes, man, would it be great to be done to have finished running the race, to be completed, to be successful, and to not have the responsibilities of life and the people who look up to me and all of the responsibilities that you might find in your life. Boy, it would be nice to be free of all of my duties and my burdens and my responsibilities. But after he kind of pines for it a little bit, kind of wistfully thinks, boy, it would be great to be free, and to be done. He recognizes, but there is still work to be done. I still have a purpose. And in for your sakes, for those who he writes to, it's better that I continue. In other words, the work isn't done. What I chose to live for, I still have to live for. He recognizes that his life helps the cause that it was dedicated to. It helps to spread the gospel, the cause of Christ, he recognizes that simply by continuing, that his life continues to prove what his peak value is, spreading the gospel. These things are worth his suffering and eventually dying for, but it's also worth his continual living and struggling for. When we think about what we're living for, what that value is, it's easy to make it things like Money and success and happiness, fulfillment, pleasure, all of these things. But those things come at a cost. When we choose to live for ourselves, we are choosing not to live for Christ. Paul reminds us that whatever we live for in the flesh, we produce that fruit. That fruit comes out. He says in Philippians 1, if I live on in the flesh, this, means, this will mean fruit from my labor. But Jesus takes that even further, not just the fact that you will produce more of the thing you live for, that there will be a, a repercussion of your labor, but he says you will know them by their fruit. And he says you will know my followers by their fruit. Jesus says you'll recognize the people who follow after me by what they do by what they prioritize. It's not just that they will reproduce after what they emphasize, but you'll know if they're really following me or not. And so Paul's primary goal was to live for Christ so that others can see that example in his suffering, in his success, in his legacy. When I think about my own life, if I ask that question, how am I living my life? I'm forced to then think, well, then what needs to change in order for others to see Christ in me? What kind of changes do I need to take on? What kind of alterations need to happen in my life so that I better reflect or grow better fruit in leading people and showing people and pointing people to Jesus? Again, he says, my desire is to depart to be with Christ, for that is far better. We as Christians, even, are sometimes so afraid of making these most important things priority because of what it might cost. What will I have to sacrifice? What will I have to give up? What do I have to deny myself? And especially, what about 
death? What about my life? What about the entirety of my life? We are focused on my life being mine. Now, Paul knows that death is not the end. It's not the final step in his life. It's not the last thing. In fact, it is just a beginning to the next. And so it's not about his life or his death. It's really about his commitment to Jesus. It's about his commitment to Christ and trusting that following is the best way. In fact, God's word is clear in declaring that we all eventually have that appointment. We all eventually have that time where we die and are judged. And Paul is absolutely certain of how well that will go for him. That he's not afraid of the end of it. But sometimes we fear that. Sometimes we run from that. And really, the Christian who knows that their life is in God's hands, who knows that their death, that their final days are in God's hand, should have comfort in that, and then it should affect the entire way that they live their life. Many people are uncomfortable thinking and talking about their death, but we should not be. Paul wasn't, and if I go back to our old friend Steve Jobs, he wasn't either. In that same address that we talked about at the beginning, he continues on to say to those students, Live each day as if it were your last. Someday you'll most certainly be right. One of these days, it will be your last day. And he also says to them, if you live each day like that, you will have a new sense of direction, of focus, of understanding. You'll lose sight of things that don't really matter. But again, he goes off and tells us to follow our heart where the Bible says to follow after Jesus, to follow after his rewards. These biblical truths, in fact, they turn the common way of understanding life and death and reality upside down. They're counterintuitive, which means they go against what we naturally want to do the way we naturally want to do. The Bible truths go against the idea of living life to the fullest. And so, as we continue on in Philippians uh, to verse 27, Paul is turning his attention to the people who have gathered, who have already begun down that journey of making Jesus first. And so he says to them, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a worthy manner of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together in one spirit and one purpose fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. It's important to note here that that worthy manner concept doesn't mean that you earned it or that you deserve it. It means that the way you act honors the gift which God has given you. The way that you conduct yourself is worthy of the blessings that he has given to you. He tells us, he tells the church, Paul tells all the church that we ought to be standing together, that we should be united, that we should be on the same page. This is a biblical command for how the church ought to function. And he's reminding the congregation there in Philippi, but also even us today, that we ought to conduct ourselves in a worthy manner, which means to be united and unified. Uh, now, Paul doesn't go through here and list all of the potential reasons that people can have discord. I don't know that we really need to go through the million reasons of problems at work and at home and at jobs that, that might cause problems, even amongst family, amongst brothers and sisters. But rather, what Paul says is, keep your eyes on Jesus, to be united to him. Because when those troubles and those hardships and those disunity and those fights, when they come along, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, it helps to make sense of all of that. We can never focus enough on Jesus. Never focus too much on the story of his life. We can never focus too much on his death, burial, resurrection, on his suffering. And we can never be too focused on the gospel of salvation through him. Only when we hear it again and again, when we refocus our lives time and time again on Jesus, 
on the gospel, on the good news? Do we even begin to recognize, we begin to have the ability to live our life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? So much of this entire look at Philippians is based on these principles, on being prepared to look after Jesus, to follow after him, to focus on him, to set our hearts and our minds on him. In a moment, as we conclude the service, there are two questions I want you to focus on, or one of two questions. You might find yourself in either of these places. Have you been trying to live your life your own way? Have you been consumed with doing things your way and have never tried to focus on Jesus before? What would it be like in your life if you instead focused on Jesus? You've seen the results of doing it your way. You've seen the results and the ramifications of having it your own way. What might it look like if you allowed him to be the focus, to be the center, to be the most important? Also, maybe you've done that in the past. Maybe you have gotten your eyes off of Jesus. Maybe you've made that attempt and struggled with it. What if today you refocused? What if you put your eyes back on him? In a moment, as Pastor Ryan sings this song, I want you to consider that. I want you to reflect on that. I want you to ask yourself that question. And if you want someone to pray with you, to talk with you, to meet with you, there's a number right here on the screen. Just text your name over to that number, and someone will call you. They will talk to you directly so that you can pray through that. But for right now, would you reflect on those questions?
Crossroads, we want to pray with you and for you, over you. If you would stand with me wherever you are, wherever you find yourself today. Lord Jesus, we know that you have spoken to us today. God, we know that you have given us an opportunity to focus on you, to put our hearts and our minds on you. God, I pray that you would be with each person, Lord, whatever their situation, whatever their struggle, whatever their difficulty. God, I pray that they would recognize you as their comfort, as their help, as their peace. God, I pray that they would see you as the one who they can put their eyes to and follow after, as the one who knows where we ought to go and what we ought to do. Lord, we pray your blessing on every person. Jesus, we ask it in your name. Amen. Crossroads, we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. Crossroads, thanks for joining us this weekend for our online services. It's a pleasure to be with you, but we would love to meet with you in person. Whether you've been here before but haven't been in a while, or you've never visited either of our campuses, feel free to reach out to me so that I can give you all the details on when we meet, on where we meet, on service time, every Sunday, 9 o'clock, 10.30, 11. We want to see you face to face. Thanks. God bless.